Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Talks. Um, I am Brianna, and we will do introductions. Today, we are talking about family law and immigration law. So if you are esteemed guests, could both introduce yourselves if we want to start. Stacy, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I am Stacy Blakeman. Um, I am the current director of career services here at the law school, and I was hired hired back in August of 2019. So I'm relatively, I guess, fresh on the job. And before that, I worked in private practice as an immigration lawyer for 10 years. And I graduated from KU Law in 09. And I'm Melanie DeRouche. I, um, let's see, let me go through all of the different background pieces. I started, um, I went to undergrad at University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois, and I graduated in 99 from there. I went and worked as um, a wilderness instructor for, well, I worked in public policy in New York City for a little while and then worked as a wilderness instructor in Florida and South Carolina working with um, kids who were in trouble down there for about two or three years and transitioned into working with their um, families and probation officers as they approached the real world. And through all of that work, I ended up uh, deciding to go to law school. And so I went to law school at Washington University in St. Louis where I graduated in 2000 let's see, 2007. <laughs> um, and I, uh, and after that, I clerked for a year for a uh, Kansas um, appellate judge. And then I worked at Legal Services of Eastern Missouri doing family law for a number of years, representing survivors of intimate partner violence um, before coming here to KU Law to teach the legal aid clinic and teach family law. Right. And just to clarify, Stacey, which side of immigration did you practice on? Yeah, so we represented families, essentially, I, I primarily did family-based immigration. Um, and so that is somebody who wants to put in an application on behalf of a spouse or fiance or a child or something like that. Um, we also assisted people with removal relief. So if they were placed in removal proceedings or had an immigration hold on them or something like that, we would um, assist them through that process and determine what form of relief, if any, was available to them. We also did things like um, U visas, victims of crimes, um, naturalization cases to get people their citizenship. Um, basically, we did not really do any sort of um, business immigration. It's just a different, kind of a different area of law. Um, we only had a couple of cases like that majority was family-based or removal relief. Thanks. Um, so we talked about uh, what you guys do now, but can you talk a little bit about what you think helped prepare you best? Any advice that you have for someone that's interested in going into either immigration law or family law? Like, I guess if you could go back in time and tell your young entering law school self a piece of advice for your career, what would it be? Not to, you know, give you a giant question right at the very beginning or anything. <laughs> so I'm gonna go rogue here a little bit. I have never made a decision in advance of a goal I was working towards. Um, I have always kind of followed what the most interesting next opportunity was. Um, and that's advice I share with a lot of students. Um, so I did not go to law school planning on doing family law. I had worked with juvenile delinquents for a long time at Outward Bound, and I felt like um, I really saw such tiny pieces of the puzzle working with one kid at a time or one family at a time that I felt like there needed to be a more systemic approach to the solution of working with these kids and their families and the way that the system was interacting with them. So I saw law school as a tool to do more systemic justice work. Um, and then while I was in law school, I worked at a big firm in New York City one summer. I worked at a small firm in St. Louis one summer, trying different pieces of what kind of motivated me intellectually as far as the work went. Um, and then it was only during my probably second year of law school, I took family law and that was a very interesting course to me. So during my third year, I took a clinic that focused on survivors of intimate partner violence. And that brought me back to kind of that people orientation of really wanting to work directly with people to solve their problems creatively and in a client-centered way. Um, and so after law school, I decided not to go with the big firm in New York City and instead clerked for a judge for a year so I could figure things out. And during that year, the opportunity came up to work in um, the family law situation at Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. Um, and so 
at that point was when I realized I really wanted to use those skills for a few years of working directly with people and using the law to help solve their individual issues in their lives. Um, however, I think if you're in law school and you do know that you're already m more mature maybe than I was in law school and you know that that orientation is where you want to be. You want to be face to face problem solving with people, looking at their situations and helping them figure out how do they rebuild after a divorce? How do they, uh, settle custody in a way that's most beneficial to their kids, if you want to work with them through the tax consequences of different property settlements, those types of things of problem solving with a really individual goal in mind. Um, there are lots of things you can do within law school to further those goals. Um, Brianna, I don't know if you want me to go into the details of in law school, but I think if you, the first thing is assessing is that the kind of work you really want to get into that one on one client centered work. And that could be family law, that could be immigration law on the side that Stacy was on or that could even be criminal defense law, all of those kinds of laws, and even employment litigation, all those kinds of areas of practice are really people focused um, and really focused on creative problem solving with a pretty static set of laws. The laws are not really in flux, at least in family law in most situations, um, but trying to figure out how they work best for an individual situation. Um, so in law school, if you wanted to follow a very defined track towards family law, um, the first thing I would say is to focus on the advocacy courses. We have a really great certificate program in advocacy. And I would say we're probably one of the better schools in the region and, and the country at developing the practical advocacy skills that lawyers need. Um, and so along those lines, you're learning really the trial level skills, the case planning and analysis skills. How do you take a messy set of facts and boil it down into a way that a client can understand and they can help figure out what their own goals are, and then you can help them reach those goals. How do you take um, uh, depositions? How do you do the discovery you need? How do you work with experts to get your litigation in good shape? And then we also have a really comprehensive mediation and alternate dispute re uh, resolution side of practice um, that we teach here through our mediation clinic. So there's all of those advocacy skills will help anyone who wants to litigate in any of these areas, but especially in family law. Um, and then also doing the kind of experiential programs that would help to develop those skills. So my clinic is um, criminal defense and juvenile justice. We do mostly um, client representation in of really vulnerable populations here in Douglas County. Um, those skills carry over very well into family law. They're things that you would need to do um, day by day with each client interviewing, figuring out the facts, interviewing witnesses, all of that. Um, and then we also have field placements with district court judges where you can learn family law. We have um, Kansas Legal Services is a um, nonprofit in the area on which I serve on their board and they have lots of field placements. Um, Legal Aid of Western Missouri out in Kansas City area also has field placements that deal with family law. So lots of different places where you can engage with the community as well as develop some of those skills. But I would say the advocacy courses, family law itself, and then tax and related courses that people would need in the family law setting would be the best course of action when you're here. And just to clarify, when you say your clinic, you're talking about the legal aid clinic. Sorry, yes, my clinic is a legal aid <laughs> clinic. We have, uh, what, four clinic, four cl live client clinics here at the law school. Mediation, legal aid. Mediation is, you know, alter dealing with people's problems and trying to help them solve them collaboratively. Legal Aid Clinic is traditionally our litigation clinic. It's the one where you're going to learn all of the skills of going to actual live court and having trials. Um, in the state of Kansas, we can have jury trials in juvenile defense cases, so that's kind of cool. Um, not every state has that. Um, and then we have an appellate clinic, which is the Project for Innocence, and the Defender Project and Project for Innocence Clinic. They do wrongful convictions work and, and innocence work. And then um, the fourth clinic is the Tribal Judicial Support Clinic. So we have four different live clinics and. Uh, and then we have multiple field placement options. And the legal aid clinic is actually, just to clarify everyone, for everyone, it's in the building, so you don't really have to go somewhere else. It's on the first floor. Um, it has its own separate entrance, but it's within the building. So if you wanted to be a part of the legal aid clinic, it's right there. So pretty yeah, easy. The difference between clinics and field placements is that clinics are taught by faculty members completely. So all of your legal work is supervised by faculty and also all of your seminar education component is, is taught by faculty. Whereas a field placement usually has a faculty member who is supervising the educational piece of it, the reflection, the seminar where you might learn some skills, but an attorney at an outside agency is supervising the actual legal work. That's really the distinction. So clinic is full faculty and 
field placement is kind of more collaboration between the law school and an outside agency. Great. Uh, Stacy, any thoughts to your former self going into looking at, I'm oh, sorry, not criminal, immigration law? Yeah, you know, I don't have like a totally dissimilar experience as far as I went to law school and did not think, I mean, I didn't even know what immigration law was. It was not on my radar at all. Um, I went to law school because I wanted to help people, which is very amorphous, right? Like I didn't really know what that meant, but that's why I went. And so I guess I kind of assumed that that was probably going to lead me to do some sort of legal aid work or something like that. Um, which was great. Um, and I ended up, after my first year, I worked with Legal Aid of Western Missouri. Um, and then after my second year, um, I'll get to know you all because you will be getting a sense of what it's like to try and secure a position after, you know, these school years. During the summer, you try to get practical experience somewhere in some capacity. And after um, my um, two all year, I really felt that sort of frenzy, like I gotta get a job, what am I, like I don't even know. And there was a position open for a solo practitioner in town who did immigration law. And one of the requirements was that they spoke Spanish. I double majored in Spanish. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm fluent, but I was like, I, I can probably do this. And so I applied and got the job and, um, Thinking about like what I, I don't know how anyone can really, you know, make perfect plans. And I think being open to the idea that you might change your mind is really useful. And so what I think I did right as far as getting where I am today is I had an open mind about things, even thinking like I want to help people. And in my mind, that meant probably working at some sort of legal aid, Kansas Legal Services, whatever. Um, and I ended up working at a private practice small firm, which is really different. And yet the substantive work I was doing, I felt like I really was being an advocate for underrepresented people. I was really providing a service that was needed. I was really, you know, doing these things that sort of kind of it met what my initial reason for going to law school was. And um, and yet I didn't even know it existed when I first showed up at Green Hall. And so I think having an open mind is great. I tried a whole bunch of different things and I did the media law clinic because I loved Professor Couch. Was I going to go into media law? Nope. And I knew that the whole time, but I really liked him. So I was like, why not? Like, there's no reason to not pursue that. And it was really research-based and um, interesting. And I mean, the First Amendment is interesting. And yet at the end of that, I was like, okay, that was fine. Um, I also did the Elder Law Clinic, which is a field placement hosted by Kansas Legal Services. And that was more engaging for me because we had the opportunity to work with actual individuals. And so, um, the work I did at Legal Aid of Western Missouri that first summer was a little bit more research-based, but we were um, meeting with members of the community to work on abating nuisance properties. Kind of random, but I really could see at the end of the summer, like, you know, we were writing um, letters to absentee landlords and things like that. And at the end of the summer, maybe one or two properties had, you know, we'd received a response and they were abating the nuisances. And I was like, this is so great. This is so meaningful for this community. And my friend who also did that was like, oh my gosh, all of that work and only one house changed. And I went into an area of practice where I was helping individuals and she ended up doing policy work. And so I think that that's, something you don't necessarily know about yourself. I love working with individuals. Um, not everybody likes that and that is okay. That might not be a great fit for you to have your client be across the table from you crying or like feeling feelings and having real life issues. And if you're like, 
that's not for me. That is completely okay. But I think doing family-based immigration might not be a great fit for you in that case. Um, and ultimately, I think trying a bunch of different things helped me identify that part of my personality to determine what would be a good career fit for me long term. Um, and then also, I had a really good and patient mentor. Um, my boss that hired me after my second summer, I ended up working with him for, gosh, yeah, 11 years total, I think. And I just didn't want to leave because he was such a fantastic mentor. I didn't, I hadn't even taken immigration law when I got the job. Literally the only reason he hired me and he told me this is because I spoke Spanish and he needed someone who could do that. And I was like, okay. And I learned it all on the job. And I think that just says that the background of skills and the fundamental like toolkit that you get at Green Hall is really going to serve you. And you don't necessarily have to take immigration law before you do a thing in that world. Because knowing how to do research, knowing where to find the answers is what being a lawyer is all about. And so I got some of that, um, you know, those experiences and exposure to an area of law that I'd never formally studied. Um, but I had a really patient mentor, which I feel really grateful for. So, um, so I, I made some notes about this. I think that's all I was going to say on this question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that if you talk to most professors and practitioners in, after law school, you, a lot of people will come into law school thinking one thing and then their experiences in law school will lead them eventually to their actual career. So there are two main, and stop me if you think I'm wrong on this, but there are two main types of law. There's transactional law, and then there's litigation law. So you kind of figure out when you go in, if you want to do advocacy and litigation, you'll lean more towards those subjects, you'll enjoy them more you want to do more transactional work, you don't really want to be in a courtroom, you'll figure that out pretty quickly. And then from there, it's kind of just narrowing down to what you enjoy more. So I always tell people, just try to take as many opportunities as you can, so you can figure out what you don't like. Um, I don't know that many people that went into law school specified on what they wanted to do and ended up doing that 10 years later. Um, a lot of people have made jumps uh, based upon experiences that they had in law school. I thought that I wanted to do family law and I realized I wanted to give away all of my services for free. That didn't really make sense working for a firm. So I ended up in criminal prosecution because I wanted to help vulnerable populations. So I think the main takeaway is, is just be open. Um, if you go into a class thinking that you're really not going to like it, still pay attention because you might be surprised. Yeah, um, one of my favorite classes in law school was transnational litigation. I loved all the jurisdictional problems and contracts gone bad across different countries and service of process issues and all of that stuff. Would I ever want to do that in real life? Not at all. But I took the class because like a friend was taking it and it was at a good time of day. And it blew my mind how much I liked it. So, I mean, it's, it's good to experiment a little bit and not just be focused on one track all the way through law school. So, yeah, yeah I surprised myself. I loved tax with Dean Mazza. Um, do I ever want to be a tax attorney? No, 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 no. But did, did I love that class and the way he taught it? Yes. So just be open to experiences and you can ask the students in the grades above you, they will be able to tell you what are good classes that they really enjoyed and you'll get mentors that way as well. So, um, okay. So the next question, you guys kind of touched on it. So if you have any clarifying points about it, how KU law would help students interested in either of those fields, family law or immigration law? And I know that we kind of talked about it, but if there's any specifics, that would be great. Um, I can say I, I left out a couple of the experiences that are really helpful that we have here. Um, one thing is our we have this medical legal partnership that places students at either 
Lawrence Municipal, uh, sorry, Lawrence Memorial Hospital, which is our local hospital here, or at KU Medical Center, um, to solve issues that people are having in the legal world that impact their ability to um, have their medical issues dealt with. Um, and so those placements often deal with some family law, some immigration law, some public benefits, getting people the health um, benefits that they need or the social security benefits that they need, wide range of issues, wills, transactional work, all of that. And so that's a field placement, um, but uh, Professor Mulligan is involved with it as well as people who are on staff with KU are the actual supervisors. Um, and so that's a really cool placement to cross over to a lot of problem solving that I think is a great second year thing to do to try to get your feet wet and kind of see the broad range of different types of cases that you can have. And then in your third year, maybe specialize a little bit more. Um, that's one really huge experience. And then we have the mock trial and all of the advocacy competitions. Um, um, we have an excellent uh, traveling mock trial team that goes around and competes nationally. We have um, appellate advocacy, moot court teams that travel around and compete nationally. Who knows what will happen with, with any of that in this um, new era, but, um, but we've been extremely successful in those competitions and the students who do those um, gain really valuable skills for the job market. And then the other thing I think that um, really makes our faculty stand out in these areas is, um, or across the board, is I have talked to faculty at other law schools. Um, no one else has this expectation as a co faculty culture that I've heard of, but we are like super invested in career services type work with all of you. Um, we, you will hear from us six months out from law school, checking if you have a job and making sure that you're happy in what you're doing. You will hear from us during law school. You have a faculty advisor who will meet with you as often as you want to talk through some of those things. Um, we try, I mean, I, as a culture, I think we really try to make ourselves super accessible for those kind of big picture planning decisions. I mean, the career services office is excellent as well, but sometimes it's nice to talk to faculty who have been, been out in different areas of practice in different states across the country. So I think our, our practical focus of, of who teaches here also benefits folks in the job market because of how we've experienced our own careers and our ability to network with the people that we know out in those fields to get you the answers you need as you make those big decisions. So, um, and I've talked to people at other, you know, other law schools and people are like, you have to do what? And we're like, no, 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 we like to do this. Um, <laughs> but it's definitely a unique kind of cultural thing for our faculty, so. Yeah, I'll echo that. We have a very, very collaborative faculty. And I, as I mentioned, I'm head of new career services, and I did not know that that wasn't normal. And it is not normal. And so you all should feel really excited about the advocacy that you're going to have from the faculty to help. I mean, obviously, that's what my office does. Like, we will help you figure out what you are going to do with your life. But having the faculty come to bat for you is huge. So we're very grateful for everything faculty does to help. Um, so just kind of practically what KU Law um, offers with regards to immigration law. So there is an immigration law course, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's called immigration law. And there's another course called representing asylum seekers and both are taught by Professor Yule. And then another um, class that you just really need to take if you are, well, first of all, I just think in general, um, is administrative law um, because it is a weird, it's just so, it's a weird world. And immigration is administrative law, which means it has sort of a separate um, process, a separate system. It has its own court system. It has its own, um, so it's an agency basically. And that is just a nice kind of foundation to understand how everything works together and how it is different from the um, Douglas County District Court and why they're not going to hear a case on removal from the United States. So um, I think that's, those are the practical things that you should consider. Um, and then, so we talked a little bit about field placements already, um, but one thing I wanted to mention is occasionally we have really great opportunities to just do random collaborations with different organizations and agencies. 
So um, <clears throat> earlier this fall, Legal Aid of Western Missouri reached out to us because they wanted to put on a U and T visa workshop, which is basically um, for victims of crimes and trafficking. And they wanted to work with students to help prepare these application packets. And the application packets involve, I mean, they're extremely intensive and it involves um, like statements from the clients. And so pouring over all of the research and all of this is just very time consuming. And not only did they want to get concrete help with this, but they wanted to provide an opportunity for students to be able to collaborate on this and learn about this area of law. Um, it was, oh gosh, we had like, I think 12 students who were able to participate. And the feedback we got was it was just not enough time because the students were into it, you know, and you just Unfortunately, in an afternoon, you can't learn all the things you need to know and you can't do all the things that you want to do. But that opened a door for us to continue to collaborate with them. And we have a great relationship with their anti-trafficking department. And so yeah, that's that's a cool thing that happened. And we have random things like that happen all the time. We have great relationships with um, organizations and agencies throughout the region. And so we are, we're fortunate. And I'll say that the legal aid clinic also, although we primarily do criminal defense and juvenile defense, so we've had the opportunity to develop these kind of um, in the moment projects that help us to respond to community needs um, as they come up. Uh, one example was when, if you remember way back in 2016, maybe it was, I don't know, 2017, um, the Trump administration uh, was uh, changing the rules for deferred action for childhood at arrivals for the DREAMers, for the DACA recipients, um, and renewals were going to be um, not available uh, in short order. Uh, we, we mobilized and had a very quickly started up clinic that most of the law students in the law school, not just the ones enrolled in the clinic, but the ones in the law school volunteered to train up to be able to do those applications really quickly. Um, and we got the word out, had a lot of media about it, trained up a lot of law students and practitioners to help people. Um, another example this year is um, some students in um, the Public Interest Law Society and um, Outlaws and Allies came to us with a project that they wanted to do and we, help, we ho helped host it, um, doing a gender marker and name change clinic for people who had um, identities that did not match what was on their legal documents. And so we tried, we worked a lot with that population. We trained up on some cultural competency and figured out how to do those um, and helped. I think we had about 80 calls in the first day we were open um, for that. And we've continued to have a pretty good influx of people who need that kind of help across the state of Kansas. So we've kind of, we kind of pivot as needed for different social needs while the core of our work remains the criminal defense work. And I apologize if uh, there's a lot of feedback. My apartment complex has decided to mow the lawn. So um, it's a little bit loud. Um, but I think one of the things that I tell, and I probably told every single person on this call, is the cool thing about KU is that if you find something that you're interested in, that you are really interested in pursuing, if you talk to a professor or a faculty member or someone on the staff about it, that they will help you in any way that they can to get into that or find a way to get you some experience with that. Um, that is one of the cool things about being a smaller school is that we have those deep ties. So if you're interested in doing something like creating a new workshop, um, you can talk to faculty members about it. And that's kind of how we were able to do some of the most recent ones that we have. Um, so I think we kind of covered all of the topics that I sent you both. Um, one thing that I would like to point out um, is that KU is in Lawrence, obviously. Um, Kansas City is one of the few areas in the United States that does have an immigration court. So we are very close to that, which if you're interested in immigration law, that's very helpful because it's only about 45 minutes away. Um, to actually go to the immigration court. Is that correct, Stacy? Mm -hmm. yep. 
Yeah. Um, do you guys have any questions? I checked the Facebook group and I didn't see any. I'm going to check again. But if any of you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask them. I do. I have some. I, uh, I currently work as a essentially a child protective services worker for a tribe up in Wisconsin. Um, and I know obviously family law is covered under the Indian Child Welfare Act in a broad sense. Um, so I was curious, um, you know, what the you know, offerings are in, in pursuing child welfare work uh, at the law school. And uh, I mean, maybe just your perspectives more generally about the like the strengths and the shortcomings of the child welfare system in Kansas specifically. Well, that second question um, is a very uh, long one to answer. <laughs> there are many uh, shortcomings and a few strengths of the child welfare system in Kansas. Um, let me start with the first one about what's here at KU Law, because that's a little bit easier. Um, so um, the courses that are related to that, of course, the main course that would address child welfare issues is called Juvenile um, Law. And that's taught by a professor who has a joint appointment in the School of Social Welfare and the School of Law. Um, and so she teaches in both areas. She runs, um, I believe she runs a, a, a program out at the Juvenile Detention Center for kids as well with some of her social welfare students, but she's been around for a very long time and is very knowledgeable about those areas of law. Um, so that's a good starting point. Family law also, we address some of that more so in the context of adoptions and the standard for terminating parental rights um, prior to adoptions. So for all of the kind of um, terminations and removals and protective services kind of stuff, that's more juvenile law, but family law is more like the creation of a family post-termination kind of situation. I, yeah. um, so there's a little bit of a divide doctrinally there because they're completely different statutes. Um, and so um, each course kind of addresses a different side of it. Um, and then as far as uh, practical experiences and training in child welfare, um, there are, uh, there's a lot going on in Kansas right now in child welfare. We have had um, massive studies of what's wrong with our system. We have probably one of the worst foster care systems in the country. Um, kids have been doing um, 101 nights a year. Where that means they're st sleeping in either a one night foster placement or in a caseworker's office overnight. Um, yeah, there's no that. consistency. There's high mobility for school situations. Yeah. So. I mean, many states have these problems. Kansas has really um, privatized its child welfare system under the Brownback administration and has not recovered yet from having kind of sent, I mean, it's down to some nonprofit agencies, but they're, they have not been well supervised. Um, and so our current governor is working to address some of those issues. The legislature is very involved in it. In 2016, we had a massive juvenile justice reform bill that went through. Um, and really fixed a lot of the early child detention issues where kids are being detained for low level, low risk offenses. Um, and really the, the goal of that reform was to keep kids back in the community doing pro-social activities and not locked up. Um, they didn't address the child welfare system at the same time, except for a sunset provision that said, basically they, at the time they could still lock up child welfare kids if they didn't have a suitable placement or the kid was a harm to themselves for 60 days up to three times in a row, so 180 days. Um, whereas the juvenile offenders could only be kept for 14 days at a time, absent to showing that they were a danger. Um, so you could commit a crime and have a lower sentence than a kid who was neglected or abused. Um, it's it's uh, messed up. We, so, can't, <laughs> we, can't, we can't put kids in secure custody uh, unless they get arrested uh, for that very reason. Yeah, so that's been the change as like that law had a sunset provision, but what didn't happen was they didn't um, actually ramp up foster placements or group homes where these kids could stay. So the system is really overtaxed with kids that they used to just house at juvenile detention centers with the offenders um, have nowhere to go. Um, we also didn't do Medicaid expansion and had a lot of problems with food stamps and everything. So we cut a lot of the basic safety net. So more kids were entering child welfare on the um, neglect side. Um, right. So right. we flooded the system and then had nowhere to put kids. Um, so Kansas Appleseed um, and the ACLU of Kansas are involved in a massive class lawsuit 
against um, the state of Kansas right now, trying to come, with, come up with some consent decrees and solutions to some of the issues, especially surrounding mental health treatment and rehabilitation for kids and addressing the trauma that the system is inflicting on them. So to say, if you're interested in those issues and you come here for law school, um, we have extensive connections with those agencies where if you're interested in the policy side of it, there would be placement opportunities to work or the litigation side of it, there'd be opportunities to work on some of that litigation with one of those agencies. Um, I'm sure they can use all hands on deck for that work. Um, right. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be interesting for sure. Um, yeah, so I think you can follow Kansas Appleseed's Facebook page or their Twitter feed and they will update you constantly on some of the developments in that litigation. Um, um, and I guess a final question would be, what would you say is the state of Indian Child Welfare Act compliance? Sorry, my cat's here. You know, I haven't come across um, a lot of ICWA issues in Kansas. Um, I'd have to ask my colleagues at Kansas Legal Services on how they're dealing with it. Um, there was a, an appellate case maybe last year dealing with ICWA in the context, I think it, it held that it was applicable in the adoption, uh, not in the adoption context, in the removal context as well. Um, yeah. there, of course, that's true, but somehow some district court somewhere wasn't following it, so someone appealed it, and they said, yes, you have to follow ICWA here. Um, yeah. So a lot of rogue judges who like to pretend it doesn't exist. Like, yeah, when I practiced in Missouri, it was a big deal. We always checked, and there was a question on your pleadings and everything, whether somebody was, had any tribal connection and all of that. Kansas, I haven't seen as much of that, but I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of non-compliance either. For sure. Brianna, did you see much of that when you were practicing family law? So I, thankfully, for my personal self, did not practice family law that long. Um, but so I never dealt with any ICWA issues and that never really came to me. Um, I was also practicing in Johnson County, Kansas. So that might be potentially why, but I, I didn't run into that. Did you say Wisconsin treats it as if it doesn't exist? No, uh, oh. we, we codified it. They unanimously passed a codification in 2009 to amplify and clarify some of the uh, what does uh, active efforts mean with regard to preservation of Indian families um, and stuff like that and really uh, creating a better relationship between the counties in which reservations are based and the tribal uh, child welfare systems. Um, I'm curious that, you know, I don't want to take up all your time, but uh, with the issue with the Medicaid expansion, does that hinder adoptions? Because I know a lot of adoptions require adoption assistance to help uh, finalize them. That might be I'm too not sure where that stands here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So practicing mostly criminal defense law, I've not kept up as much on the nitty gritty of some of those things right now. Um, but I could certainly find out those answers or you, help you find a placement that would help you see them in real life. Sure. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I checked and I didn't get any more. So last call. All right, well, thank you both for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate it, and I hope that everyone enjoyed our Tuesday talk. Um, I cannot recall off the top of my head what the next one is. I believe it is business and commercial law with professors Ware and Yule. Um, and then the one after that is the Dean's Roundtable with Dean Mazza, um, Dean Terranova, and Dean Alka. So, please join for those. I think the Dean's Roundtable one will be helpful. Hopefully we have some more answers by then about um, what the semester will look like. I'm not sure though. So since I do not make those calls, but. Well, I'm, I'm gonna move to Kansas anyway. I already signed my lease. I don't wanna move in December. Good. Um, and if anyone has any questions about moving, um, we all know the area. So please feel free to reach out um, we can help you find a place, let you know how close it is really to campus. I think that sometimes miles um, sound pretty far, but Lawrence is a pretty small area, so nothing's too far from each other. So Does it have a good bike? Good bike? Yeah, like, yeah, it's good for biking. Yeah. You mean trails or roads or? or um, Both, I guess. There are a yeah. bunch of great um, options in Lawrence. There's the Lawrence River Trail is really great single track. 
um, and it's well maintained. And then down by Clinton Lake, there's some technical skills courses. And then there are some pump tracks and other technical courses out by Kansas City. There's the Shawnee Mission pump track and skills course, a bunch of awesome trails. Um, and then for roads, there's the Lawrence, uh, for like paved trails, there's the Lawrence Loop. Actually, Lawrence is closing this loop trail that goes all the way around the city as a bike, a paved bike trail that kind of goes through different neighborhoods and things. Um, it's pretty bike friendly. There are clubs. If you're on Facebook, there's the Lawrence Mountain Bike Club, the Lawrence Cycling Club. Um, there's a group of women that go out and ride on a Monday ride. There's a Thursday social ride, a Friday night pub ride, um, all sorts of stuff for people who are into cycling. So. I'm so glad you're on this call because I do not know the answer. I've gotten into mountain biking, so. Yeah, I have a, I have a, also rides a quite a bit. what's that? I have a fat tire bike uh, since there's a lot of snow biking up here. So there's an amazing race in Kansas in the summer called the Dirty Kanza, which is a gravel race. It's dirty because it's so dusty, but it's like this high endurance uh, gravel bike race that a lot of people here do. Um, Sunflower Bike Shop downtown here in Lawrence is a big supporter of it and there are clubs that train just for that race all year round. There's a professor in public administration who rides it every year. Big community of cyclists. So you'll find something. Yeah. And it is hilly. So just be prepared for that if you're biking in town. Uh, I know that everyone says that Kansas is flat, but the campus of KU is not. So <laughs> <laughs> FYI. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. If you guys have any more questions, please feel free. I'm sure that both of our guests would be willing to answer any emails that you have, but also you can put a question on the Facebook group and I can reach out to them as well. So Great, thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you kindly. It was good to finally see you in person, Jacob. Yeah, it was great to see everybody. Oh. Hi, Bridget. Bridget. I know wherever you are. You are. We don't hear you, but we see your name out there. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I look forward to seeing everybody at orientation, ideally. Yes. <laughs> All right. Have a good day.